He is a rugby player whose career has really taken off in the last few years. Plucked from relative obscurity in Australia, he now captains one of the biggest clubs in Europe, has won the Aviva Premiership, and harbours hopes of making England's World Cup squad despite a big injury setback. Before we meet Ed Slater, let's take a brief look at him in action. He's the strong running second row who's powered his way into the England setup in recent months. Just a few years ago, Ed Slater was playing part time in Australia. Now he captains one of the most prestigious clubs around, Leicester Tigers. Now is, is the time for me to kind of step up and, and show a bit of leadership. And he's certainly done that. On the pitch, he helped Tigers become Premiership champions two years ago. Unfortunately, he's now having a lengthy spell off it due to injury. But he's determined to get back playing soon to give himself a chance of making England's World Cup squad in the autumn. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the Leicester Tigers captain, Ed Slater. You had if you just want to take a seat there, thank you. We won't need the water. <laughs> <laughs> right, well, we saw a, a, a couple of clips of you playing, brief clips there, Ed, but there was one try in particular that I'm sure will have caught the audience's attention there. That powerful run from the halfway line to score a fantastic try against Sale. Does that, do you think, set you apart from other second rows, your ability to run powerfully with the ball like that, or was that just a one off? I think you said it, yeah, it's a bit of a one-off. I would have probably preferred to see Ozzy Ardiles highlights, to be honest, <laughs> being up there. But um, Yeah, I think Sale had kind of given up the game by that point, so they didn't show how many minutes was on the clock. I think it was about 70, and they were losing by 20, and they thought, I oh, will give them a canter in. So uh, you did show the dive, which I've got a lot of stick for as well. It's more like a belly flop slash roll. Um, but, yeah, I, you know... I enjoyed that and, and off the back of that I got a, an opportunity to tour Argentina with England that was cut short through another injury but um, it certainly helped my cause, yeah. And um, in terms of your career making it into professional rugby, it was a pretty unconventional route, wasn't it? Yeah, it was, yeah. I, you know, sorry for any parents but I failed at school miserably. Um, I was also a failed footballer. Um, and rugby was kind of my next route, so I started playing at my local club at 16. Uh, and from there, yeah, I failed my A-levels. I think my parents still think I'd pass with flying colours, but uh, I kind of used the excuse of a gap year for my failure to get into uni and went out to Australia. And from there, I, you know, I learnt the game, uh, really. You know, I managed to find a good club and uh, I had good experiences. I worked as a cleaner and had jobs at a pizza shop and... All of those things, you know, great life experiences. And then somehow uh, got myself a trial at Leicester Tigers. So, yeah, it was, it was an interesting way into the game, not, not the conventional route. And you mentioned that experience in Australia. What was that like playing part-time and having those, should we say, quirky jobs as a cleaner and a pizza worker? <laughs> Brilliant. You know, I lived, <laughs> Brilliant. I was, you know, I lived in Bondi, Great Beach, Sydney, amazing city. Um, you know, I, I was on my own now, I was 18 years old, uh, you know, and, you know, what more can I say, it's a great place to be, I made some good friends, I, I was playing, I was training Tuesday, Thursday, so it wasn't too serious, um, and earning pittance at a, a pizza shop, I was probably earning me money through eating the pizzas, to be honest, but <laughs> they still don't know how much I took, really, but, um, it was a great, great experience, yeah. Yeah, I had a great time in Australia. And were you a good cleaner? <laughs> was I a good cleaner? Uh, well, all I'll tell you, I got sacked from the cleaning <laughs> <guys. laughs> So that tells you, that tells you. Now, uh, it, it was a funny job, really. We, we'd start in the morning at about five, five o'clock in the morning, and we'd started off at this dingy hospital, which was horrible. Uh, and I was working with this Aussie bloke that had the, massive, the biggest chip on his shoulder. You know, he could have been this, he could have been that. And so I used to sit for days on end 
driving around in a van for seven hours a day cleaning these apartments with this bloke that would tell me how hard his life had been. Um, and by the end of it, I decided to stop turning up, really. So uh, <laughs> that's, why I got the, that's, why, that's why I got the chop. This bloke was just doing my head in. <laughs> and I imagine the culture must have been a little bit different playing part-time in Australia to playing professionally with the Tigers. Possibly a, a few more refreshments on a weekend than maybe now? Yeah, I mean, there was a bit of a club, a social club, where we, we used to go out Friday nights, play on a Saturday, which wouldn't go down well now, um, to say the least. But I did, before, my only experience of rugby before that was Milton Keynes, which is, God, I don't know, eight, eight nine, ten levels below the Premiership. And, you know, our winger, Chips, as his name was, used to have two pints of Guinness to warm up, so... Uh, it wasn't too big. A, it wasn't a big transition. It was the uh, it's a transition from Australia to coming back here that was the learning experience. Yeah. So that change, that so we say, you know, career culture shock, if you like, going from part time in Australia to the professional environment at one of the top clubs in Europe, Leicester yeah. Tigers. What was that like? That adjustment. Well, the reason I got the trial at Leicester was uh, there was an English coach in Australia who'd. Um, he kind of taken over the club that I was playing at and he, after a year or so he kind of been prepping me now I look back in hindsight been prepping me telling me stories about the great Martin Johnson and all these lesser sides um, you know and I've been soaking it up and, and then anyway a year later he decided that that I um, was ready if you like to, to have a trial at Leicester and he arranged that for me um, but he like I say he built those stories up he built the culture up of the place he built the experience you know the, the attitude of the place so when I arrived, I wasn't so much on the back foot. I knew what to expect, and um, it, it was an interesting first day at the club. You know, I, t I turned up, and I was, I was fortunate because Jeff Parling was was injured at the time. He's he obviously a British lion now. Richard Blaze had to retire, so I was quite fortunate that I got a chance there. But I turned up in the changing room, and I, I put my kit in. And, you know, I've got some big name players. Lewis Moody was around me. All of these players, Harry Ellis, it could go on and. I put my stuff in the chain room and went up, kind of kept my head down, went up to the gym, did some weights, came back down, and my stuff was in the bin. <laughs> <laughs> my trainers closed. But it took me about half an hour to realise because I was kind of looking around, oh my God, where have I put my stuff? Looked around the chain room, nowhere. Walked out. Didn't dare ask anyone because, you know, who the hell was I kind of situation. So anyway, after half an hour, I went to throw something in the bin and then see, see some jeans and t-shirt in there I thought right okay obviously I've taken someone's spot um, so that set the tone really <laughs> it sounds a bit of a cruel place about but that as well I'd, no no I didn't complain you know I've done it since myself so no you know it sounds a bit cruel but it, that's, that's the sports environment is uh, that kind of environment you've got a lot of lads that have never really left school um, that are still kind of in that mindset play stupid jokes on each other. I mean, there's, there's a couple I could probably tell you about that are ridiculous. But um, So, yeah, I, I learned from that experience, yeah. And when you got in that dressing room, what was it like looking around and seeing some of those big names? Did you get starstruck or did you just get your head down, take your jeans out the bin and crack on? Well, because it was in a chain, most of them were naked half the time, so I had to keep my head down. And, <laughs> and, uh, the, you know, oh, gee, I... I was, Seen him play on a rugby pitch, but not quite like that. Um, but no, it, 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 you just had to deal with it. I mean, it, it's, a tough, it's a tough place to learn your rugby, and, and that's kind of why it's been a standout club for such a long time, is, is that there's quite a hard edge about it. But once you're in, you're in, and, and um, you wouldn't want to be anywhere else. So uh, it, it was a learning experience, and you try and, you, you know, part of my job is to pass that down, certainly as captain now. Um, we've lost a lot of older players that built that culture. Um, certainly, last of them are pretty much gone. George Shooter retired last year. Lewis Deacon, um, you know, is, is close to that as well. So um, there's, a, there's a few of us in that chamber that have to pass that culture down, really. And when you got there, who were the key people in the dressing room, the key players that were a big influence on you that you looked up to, um, and, and why? Well, at, at Oval Park, which is a training ground, there's, there's two separate training training uh, changing room sorry so as soon as you get in it's called the young spunkers changing room which is where all the young <laughs> sorry 
Sorry, but that's the way, you know, I'm just telling you the truth, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> you won't embellish on that but, one. No, no, but uh, they're all the young lads that are in that changing room and, you know, there's a few stories about the weekends passed around. Then you've got the other changing room, which is where all the senior boys are, who have made loads of appearances for the club, they've played for England and done all of this, that and the other. The defining difference is there's no windows in the, in the younger changing room and it stinks. The, the, the senior chain room, nice, loads of windows, airy, coffee machine, speakers. So, you, you know, um, when I got there, it was just the young lads telling stories. You, you wanted to get in the other chain room, if I'm honest with you. That was the incense of the carrot for yeah, you. And yeah. I imagine with some of those big players, won a little bit before your time, yeah. but only just Martin Johnson, who yeah. clearly there's parallels there with you, uh, a second row who went on to Captain Tigers, and then from there... Captain England, of course, to, to World Cup glory. Do you ever think about that and think, you know, I want that as well, that's what I'm aiming for? Um, you know, certainly when I arrived at the club, if you'd have said I'd have made 100 appearances and captained the club, I would have probably laughed at you before hitting you. Um, <laughs> but, <laughs> but no, in all, in all honesty, Ryan Johnson, he's a, you, you can't achieve what he's achieved, you can't really aspire to what he's aspired, but you know, when I've played for the club, I'm very much aware that the shirt I'm wearing, the number four jersey for Leicester, is made because of him, really. So I'm very lucky to, to be able to wear the shirt and to be able to captain, captain the club, definitely. Um, whether I'll do what Martin Johnson's done, probably not, no. I won't do that. <laughs> <laughs> well, lots of you guys out there have been asking uh, questions uh, for... Ed this evening, thank you very much indeed for doing that. I'm just going to cross to my colleague Wesley Smith, who's out and about and got a couple of your questions, Wesley. Yes, some very searching questions indeed from the floor tonight, uh, Mark. I can tell you, the things your better half told me, I think we'd better keep those quiet for now. Uh, let's get to a question from uh, Jeff Pike. Um, we're going to put you on the spot here, Ed. Who do you prefer, Richard Cockrell or Jordan Murphy? Who Richard Cockrell or Jordan Murphy? Uh, well, Richard Cockrell signed me. Richard Cockrell <laughs> plays me and he picks me in the team. Uh, so I'm going to have to say Richard Cockrell. I get along with Jordan very well. Maybe in another forum, Jordan, but... <laughs> uh, what did you think of that answer? I, I think it was very good, yeah. I, I went to Jordan Murphy's wedding last year. So, did um, you? yeah. Free bar, wasn't it? He's got a very attractive wife, hasn't he? Free bar. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, were you there? Hey? Were you there? No, I, I wasn't there. I was away. I was oh, away, right. but I, yeah. I've heard lots of stories about it. Yeah, I, sort of, I woke, woke up at dawn, sort of, everybody still dressed around, sort of. You got any stories about Yeah, loads. Yeah, I'll tell That's you. That's probably later. quite enough of that one. Okay. Yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll <laughs> you okay, more from me. We got another one. We have uh, Mr. Ozzy Ardiles here at the oh. table here. Great to see yeah. you again tonight. Our legend. Thank you for being here. So, question from Ozzy is. Um, We heard you allude to football a bit earlier, and Ozzy says, you know, rugby's okay, but why didn't you try a bit harder and consider the superior game? Well, you know, I like didn't I, say that. <laughs> <laughs> Ozzy, you can say whatever you like, mate, come on. Um, to be honest, like I said, I was a failed footballer, so my body didn't really agree with the game. I got a bit fatter, um, I got a bit lumpy and tall and... I didn't really want to play in goal, so <laughs> <laughs> rugby was the next best, best option for me, but ideally I'd have played number nine for Charlton Athletic, but it didn't quite happen. Sounds fair. Yeah, sounds fair, yeah. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much indeed. Some... I'm not going to argue with him. <laughs> yeah, indeed. And one more there, Wesley. Okay, yeah, well, let's, let's cross over to, uh, to the middle of the room here, because we've got Bill Dempsey, who's the, uh, obviously the Jersey rugby chairman. Keep me oh, fit. Oh, we are. Oh, there we go. Face. Okay. Question is, why did Leicester take Tommy Bell from Jersey? Do you want the truth, <laughs> or do you want me to tell you? You want the truth. Uh, you want, well, tell us well firstly, Tommy Bell wanted to come. Oh. That's all I'm going to tell you. <laughs> oh, poor old Tommy. He'd prefer to be in Leicester no, no, rather no, than no, Jersey. No, no. <laughs> Say that again, Bill. I said, poor old Tommy, he'd prefer to be in Leicester rather than Jersey. 
<laughs> That's a fair point. I've got nothing on that, yeah. <laughs> I heard a few of you moaning about how the weather was terrible here. I said, it's never going to be worse than this weather in Leicester, ever. So, um, I don't know. I, you know, Matt Tate's leaving this year. He's our first choice fullback. I suppose Tommy Bell saw an opportunity to, to play Premiership rugby. And um, since he's arrived, I, I didn't know much about Tommy when, when he arrived at Leicester, but... He's been brilliant and he, he's shown his class really and I, I, I think he'll do extremely well for us. Um, and he's got a lot of good things to say about Jersey as well. So I asked him about Jersey before I came here um, and he was really positive about the club and the direction they're taking. So he's a good lad, Tommy. Uh, Ed, thanks very much for that. Um, obviously, we were sorry to, use, to lose Tommy, but also um, aspirations for the World Cup squad this year? Uh, well, I thought they would disappeared when I got injured last summer playing for England. Um, I thought I'd pretty much given up all hope, which is, you know, fine. That's the way it, it works. That's the way sport works. But, um, you know, with, I could be back in a couple of months and I've had a lot of chats with Stuart Lancaster and Graham Rountree and, you know, there's positive news from them that potentially I could still make the wider World Cup squad, which they, they name it to start off with. Um, so there's, there's still a slim chance, um, and that's what I work towards, really. Thank you very much, and thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed for your questions so far, hopefully more later. <laughs> so, would you say, just picking up on Bill's point there, it is just a slim chance then for you that you'll make the England World Cup squad? Well, they, they name a squad of about 45 blokes to start off with that gets cut down to 31, which will be the World Cup squad. So um, when I say there's a slim chance, you know, there's potential for me to be named in that squad. I don't know yet. It's, it's a long way from being named. But um, like I say, I've had positive chats with the coaches. Um, my last input with England was a captain in the midweek side. And, um, and you know, they were, they were happy with the job I did. So hopefully that will count. And... On top of having a year off, I'll be fresh to uh, put my hand up and everyone else will be battered. It, mu <laughs> <laughs> it must be tempting for you to kind of get back that bit quicker, maybe think, oh, well, you know, am I quite ready, but I'm, gonna, oh, I'm desperate to get back on the pitch. How important is it that you get back at the right time for you for the long term, not just for the short oh, term for the World Cup? Oh, most important thing for me. I have, yeah, I have to keep perspective because, uh, like you say, it's quite easy to go, right, I'm, I'm going to play in five weeks when he feels great. I'm going to jump on the pitch and, you know, you, you do your ACL twice, you're in big trouble. So it's, a, it's a, a bad injury to get to start off with. So I'm always aware. The physios and medical staff at Leicester are uh, huge um, in making sure that you're in the right shape before you get back. So, my, you know, that World Cup is a great dream. You know, I'd love to be involved in it. If it doesn't happen, it's more important for me to be able to play on for six, seven, eight years than it is to, to play in the World Cup. Um, as odd as that may sound to some people. So, um, yeah, like I say, you have to keep perspective, get me knee right, and if it happens, it happens, really. England are clearly going to have very, very high hopes of doing well on home soil in the autumn. What would represent a successful tournament for them? In the Six Nations or... Sorry, in the, in the World Cup. In the World Cup. Um, what would be a successful World Cup? Is, it, is it win or nothing? You know, is, oh, it's, is making yeah, the no, no, it's, okay? it's got to be. Is it's making the final all right no, and losing no, no, no. to a good New Zealand side? Uh, no, it's got to be. It's got to be win or nothing for them. Um, it's, we have the same mentality at Leicester. It, it doesn't. You don't talk about your season objectives at the beginning of the season. There's, you know, there's no point going. Well, we want to finish in the top four, or we want to get to the quarters of the Europe. It, you just want to win it. You want to win the Premiership. You want to win the Europe. That's. It's as simple as that. And the same for England. They've built a great squad over the last three, four years. I think Stuart Lancaster's doing a good job. He's, it's a different, different team to what it was under Martin Johnson. Uh, and I think actually we've got the quality and we've shown um, that we've got the quality to win the World Cup. Uh, we've beaten New Zealand, although we struggled the last few times. It's not been as... Um, the gap between us isn't as big as, as it once was. And then I think every other team under New Zealand is there for the taking, really. We're all... Um, kind of competitive so yeah the, the message will be it's simple we want to win the World Cup particularly on home turf and you mentioned um, that start maybe that Stuart Lancaster had things were going well and then as you said they tripped up a, a couple of times against the, the bigger teams New Zealand in particular so how confident are the squad that they actually can 
go on and win the World Cup? Oh, I think they're complete. You know, they've got a lot of confidence in themselves. Yeah, I was on that tour in New Zealand last summer when we lost the three test games and everyone was kind of, you know, blowing up about it over here in the press and, you know, saying how we've gone backwards. And, um, but not many teams win in New Zealand. Um, first test, it was our fault that we lost the game. Second test was very tight. Third test, it had been a long season for us. You can't underestimate playing two, two test series against the All Blacks halfway around the world. The third test just got away from us, so that was blown a bit out of proportion. I thought we played well. And then again in the autumn, uh, we probably struggled a little bit with injuries and uh, that didn't help us against South Africa or, or, or the All Blacks. But I don't think those games are a true reflection of the, of the side. I think they've built a good, good team and certainly that start in 15 that they've got, ideally, We'll, we'll beat any team on their day, yeah. Who are the favourites for the World Cup, in your eyes? Um, well, I think England will be because of home advantage. Playing at Twickenham, they're a hard team to beat at Twickenham. And then the All Blacks always, are always up there. They won the last World Cup. I, I mean, I play with Brad Thorne at Leicester. And it, the amount of times he just bangs on about New Zealand and how good they are. And <laughs> <laughs> So they'll always be favourite. I, I think, you, t if I'm honest, you're looking at South Africa, New Zealand or England. Those, those three would be the three teams that will be, be vying for the World Cup, really. Not worried about Australia in the group? It's a tough group, but, um, you know, I don't want to be disrespectful to Australia, but I, I don't think that... <laughs> you're getting some encouragement you can go ahead. <laughs> yeah, they made me clean there. You know, yeah, um, <laughs> no, um... Honestly, you know, I think we've shown that we can beat Australia. Um, we probably struggled a little bit more against New Zealand and um, South Africa. That's probably why I say it, to be honest with you. Domestically, things haven't maybe been going as well for Leicester Tigers as, as you and the players and the staff would have wanted. Why do you think that's been? Uh, that's a good question, if I knew the answer. Um, we could say because I'm not playing. It's the obvious yeah, answer. It's the answer, isn't it? But no, no. But you know, it's, it's, uh, we, we struggle with injuries, but not you know across the board in key positions, centres, people like Manu Tuolangi is massive to the way we play. Um, that ten position has been a bit bit iffy for us. Uh, so the, the combination of those things, we just found it hard to find that consistency, which which, which we're really good at, usually. Um, but we never traditionally start well, so it's about, these, it's about the next three, four months, to be honest with you. That's where we usually pick up our game. That's ever since I've been at the club, it's always been a bit of a ropey start. And then by the end of it, everyone's going, well, where, where have Leicester come from? And, you know, we're second or third or fourth. So, uh, you know, that's ingrained in the club as well. Um, yeah. Failure is not really accepted, to be honest with you. Well, standards are so high there, and you mentioned yeah. a little earlier, a bit like England, you know, winning at the World Cup is the, is the only yeah. you know, representation of success. But for Tigers this season, where they are on the table, is, is actually just finishing in the top four good enough for this campaign, bearing in mind where you were earlier in the campaign? Is top four good enough? Top, well, that's all sure we want, really. Um, listen, you know, when you look at how the club's performed over the season, everyone's gone, oh, it's a catastrophe and we've lost this game, we lost that game. And when you look at the teams around us, we're, we're similar, I think we're the same as Saracens um, and a couple of other clubs around us and they're all having great seasons. So how can we be on the same points as these teams that are doing brilliantly and ha oh, suddenly we're, we're so poor? So you, like I said before, you've got to keep perspective on it. Um, top four's the aim. You want a home semi, it doesn't always happen. Um, but you get in that top four, then anything goes really. And some teams are used to playing semi final knockout rugby, and some teams aren't, and that's the difference. Just focusing on things domestically here uh, in the islands, there's a big you know, rugby following, and it's a, it's a very big sport here. We heard from the Jersey chairman a yeah. few moments ago. They've had several promotions in pretty quick succession. What have you made of their progress? Uh, I think it's brilliant. I mean, there's a close link between Leicester and Jersey. Uh, we've travelled here for two years now, I think, in, in pre-season friendlies. I know quite a lot of the lads that are, are playing at Jersey. Um, and like, like, like we said earlier, Tommy Bell's come to the club. 
Um, I was, I was said to Bill earlier, I was really pleased to, make, to see that they, they've stayed up, that they haven't dropped down because um, I think it's good for the, for the rugby union and for the game that Jersey are in that competition, that they're representing um, the islands in that competition because uh, sometimes it can get a bit stuck over in, in, uh, in the, on the mainland, if you like, with the, the same kind of generic club. So to have Jersey in there doing well, similar to London Scottish and, and staying there is, is good for rugby. It's been a bit of consolidation, a little bit more progress from Jersey this season after two tough seasons, admittedly, in a very difficult league, the Championship. Can they progress much further? Can they actually realistically challenge for another promotion or does it take the level of investment that, say, Worcester and Bristol have to really challenge to, to go up into the Premiership? I don't I think we should get Bill up for that question, to be <laughs> honest with you. Um, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know the ins and outs of Jersey Rugby Club, but... What <laughs> he's, he's shaking his head at me. <laughs> <laughs> um, you look at a club like Exeter. I don't know. You know, if they they've got the financial backing, I think anything's possible, isn't it? Really, you can't rule it out. Um, they, they, like, like we said, they've done really well to consolidate their place in the championship. This, the step up, and Bill will agree, between National League One and the championship is that's probably the biggest step up. If I'm if I'm honest with you. Um, so to consolidate their place in the league, I think is is brilliant, and and hopefully they can stay there. And and obviously for the local lads, it's it's brilliant because coming from Milton Keynes, there's not much in Milton Keynes, rugby wise. You know, so so for Jersey to have a club in the championship, you know, I'm I'm envious of, of them. And in terms of uh, this weekend, there's a connection there as well in terms of Jersey and who they're playing. They're up against Nottingham, your former side. Bearing in mind Nottingham are doing pretty well this season, how tough a test will that be? For Jersey, uh, yeah, I think Jersey are, are pretty strong at home. To be honest, I know that I know this week there's a couple of lads from Leicester that are on loan at Nottingham, and I spoke to them. I said, you know, how are you getting down there? And their travel arrangements don't sound too great. Um, so I, I don't know that could help. That could help Jersey. Nottingham are a traditionally a strong club in the Championship. They're very, you know, they're very set in where they are in the Championship. They they have a lot of loan players from from Leicester, which I think helps them. Um, and, and then Martin Hogg's a, a brilliant coach for them as well. So uh, they're definitely one of the tougher teams to play in the championship, but they're, they're, all, they're all pretty similar level. Across the water, uh, Guernsey not playing at quite the same level, but it's a big sport in, in Guernsey as well. They're currently struggling at the bottom, bottom of National 3. When you're in that sort of relegation battle, what sort of credentials do you think you need to get yourselves out of it? And in this case, Guernsey get themselves out of it to pull away from the bottom of that league? Uh, I'd, uh, I'm a big believer in week by week, take things week by week. You know, you, obviously Guernsey will want to look at uh, staying in the league. That's their main ambition. Um, but the short term picture is, is the most important. So week by week, I, they'll take the games as they come in. How big a thing is belief and momentum? Uh, how big is belief and momentum? Oh, that's a serious question. <laughs> um, yeah. yeah, momentum's big. You, you win, you win, you win, you win, you win. And that's, then your expectation is on winning all the time. Uh, and you kind of, in the closing minutes of the game, in the last 20 minutes, you have that kind of psychological edge over a team that's probably desperate to win and maybe used to losing. So um, that's why I say the short term is the most important. We're going to win this game. How are we going to win it? Um, and then go and do it. You know, you start looking ahead too far. Um, that's where you kind of fall down, really. OK. Let's just uh, head out once again and see if uh, Wesley Smith, my colleague, has got a couple more questions. Right over here at the, uh, at, at the back of the room now, with the, with the group who are making the, their presence felt tonight. Are you having a good evening? Yes, thank you. <laughs> OK. Question we have here is, do English players play too much professional rugby, uh, internationals, etc. Um, the likes of New Zealand play perhaps 20 games a year. Well, I play with a few Kiwis and they're always moaning. Always <laughs> moaning about how many games we play. So I suppose the simple answer to that is yes. Um, they do play a lot less than us. They get longer breaks. Um, I think in total there's about 35 games in an English league season, which when you consider the game is... A lot. Uh, I think I played 30 games last year and I've ended up with a, 
a broken knee. So how much that has to do with playing 30 games of Premiership and whatever level rugby. Uh, but I don't really see how any way it can be shortened. So that's the way it is. You just, the, the best way you can deal with it is learn how to look after yourself and, and be as professional as possible. But in an ideal world, yeah, we'd have less games, but you, it's just not going to happen. Um, I think the Southern Hemisphere teams probably benefit off the back of that. OK. Got one more there, Wesley. Yes, we have indeed, from, uh, from Cliff Chipperfield. Hi. Uh, we, uh, we had Bath over pre-season, and I was talking to those guys, and they said they had a, a number of young players who... They've got a squad of 50, 60, and Bristol came over this year with 50, 60 signed on as well. Are, are, are you've got, have you got guys at Leicester that aren't playing much rugby through the season? You've got your first team, you've got your A-League. Have you got guys who are sort of playing half a dozen games and no more? Um, we do, yeah. Um, that, that, that's a, a big problem. I mean, we have quite a big squad at Leicester, a lot bigger than some, some other teams. Uh, and we have a development squad, which is guys kind of from when they leave the academy at 18 to 22. Um, and it's, it's difficult for them. They, they don't play many games. They play the A-League games, which only last half a year. Uh, and other times they hold pads at training. Um, the, the difference is, is how, how, you, uh, how you get out of that situation. You know, when I started at Leicester, there wasn't really a clear pathway to the first team for me. And I had to hold pads and get beaten up every week, every Monday, Tuesday in forward sessions was a bleeding nightmare. Um, it's how you, how you get out of that situation and, and that's a tough bit for some of those young lads because they come straight out of school. They used to be in the main superstar at school, everyone loves them, you know, they're the, big, the next big thing, they're going to do this, they're going to do that. Uh, and then they're shoved in and suddenly no one really cares about them, they've got to fend for themselves. So. That's where I've benefited in the unconventional route. I've kind of had a good, enjoyed myself in Australia and had stupid jobs. And so um, the drive's a little bit different. But for, the, for those lads that are kind of coming from school straight into that environment, um, some, some make it, some learn how to deal with it, and, and some don't. Thank you very much, Wesley. Thank you for your questions as well. Um, obviously, it's our... It's our big awards night tonight. What have you made of the sportsmen and women shortlisted for awards this evening? Yeah, well, I was, I was speaking to Tobin earlier in the toilet, as it happens, but <laughs> <laughs> of all black, I heard him mention Milton Keynes, which is where I went to school, and I thought, oh, brilliant, let's talk about Milton Keynes. Um, we both ended up slating it. <laughs> um, he seems like a really good guy, and I, I was, you know, before, before, when I was invited to the awards, I thought, brilliant, I'm going to have a look at, at these guys, and... Um, I think they've been exceptional, you know, I think Lauren, what, listening to her speak about uh, her team, the way she cares about the team, it's, it's obviously clear how much she cares about the, uh, the people around her and, and she's obviously good captain material. Um, and again with the other guy, you know, <laughs> um, you know, Tobin again is a great prospect and some of the, the, the professional events he's won and the, the team he's riding for is, is uh, fantastic. In, um, hopefully, here push on it again as he has this year from last year. Um, and ag again, when you speak about the other guy, Miles, Bill was telling me a bit about Miles, and so is Steve, who's on my table as well. And um, he's a brilliant prospect to be achieving what he's achieved in swimming is, uh, you know, exceptional. And then obviously Lucy, the, the stuff she's had to deal with. So all, all four of them, are, I think, are, are exceptional athletes and. Um, you know, to be able to handle an award to them, you know, me, you know, I think it's, I'm, I'm very honoured to be able to do it. So that they're all very deserving, um, and I couldn't tell you, you know, from reading their CVs, who, how to pick them apart, really. Lots of talent here this evening. Just one very brief final question, because we are out of time. But if you were to have one or two sentences of advice for these guys trying to make it, trying to fulfil their dreams, what would you say to them? Uh, what would I say to them? Uh, it's a good question. I'll, I'll probably say just, it's a bit of a cliche, but self-belief. Uh, and I don't mean outwardly, I don't mean arrogant or being obnoxious. I, I just mean having a bit of belief in yourself. To, for, for me, it was about turning up at Lesser Tigers on a trial, month trial. I should never really have been there, you know, that wasn't really the path I was, I was on. Um, but I just had to have a bit of confidence in myself. Not, and like I say, not in an arrogant way, but 
that, that will help you if, you if you just give yourself a bit of a, a break and, and believe in yourself. I think he's been a wonderful guest, hasn't he, this evening? Ed Slater, ladies and gentlemen. Really appreciate your time. Thank you. Ed Slater.